Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the second day of Selector Pro 2021. Um, yesterday's sessions covered things like, well, some best practices in the music industry in 2021, uh, discussed the possibilities of working with your fan base more efficiently, just some of the topics covered yesterday. So here we're back with another panel discussion, a great panel discussion for you today. Well, we all know that 2020 was a very challenging year for the music industry. Depending on which bit of the music industry you were in, it was either quite challenging or catastrophically challenging. And so we're gonna be having a look in this conversation at how different people working in different countries, in different strands of the industry, dealt with those challenges, what they anticipate will be the challenges and the opportunities in the year ahead, and some tips and advice and practical information um, to help you get the most out of your career in music, both right now, as we're still navigating the whole COVID pandemic, and then as hopefully that pandemic starts to wind down and things start to get back to normal. So that is the topic today. I should quickly introduce myself before I get the panelists to introduce themselves. So my name is Chris Cook, and I run a company in London called CMU. We help people to navigate and understand the music business, and we do that in a number of different ways. So we report on the music industry through our daily email bulletin and our podcast and our website. We do lots of training courses and workshops for everybody from artists and songwriters, labels, promoters, managers at all levels in the music industry. We do lots of research and we present at lots of events around the world, including quite a few with the British Council. So that's who I am and uh, what we do. So what I'm going to do now is to get each of my five panelists to do an incredibly speedy 60 second introduction because we've got a lot to cover in this 45 minute session so i'm going to basically go down the list in the order i have it in my notes on my screen so we'll get uh, marcel to introduce himself first hi my name is marcel huyak uh, from uh, bosnia and herzegovina uh, working in the music industry in the last 15 uh, years uh, collaborated also with um, advertising and cultural sector recently um, uh, we uh, founded uh, BAMC Conference, regional uh, MICE uh, conference for the music industry and currently regional coordinator for United We Stream Balkan. Fantastic. Lots covered in your 60 seconds there. Um, let's get Olga next. Um, uh, hello, uh, I'm Olga Udevenko. I'm working in Culture Advoca project. Uh, it's a music project uh, born in Kharkiv. Uh, it, it's a music school uh, for DJing and uh, electronic production. Also, it's a club, a record label, and we also have a store uh, for some audio equipment and uh, records. Uh, in this project, I'm running the programs for the club uh, parties and also managing the school uh, as a program manager also. I'm uh, working in this area for four years since uh, Kulturas Buka opened uh, as a store. And uh, now uh, my uh, main focus is the parties and program for the school. Fantastic. OK, let's get Sergei to introduce himself next. Hello, everybody. My name is Sergei Korzachenko. I'm from Kyiv, Ukraine. I have um, more than 30 years in uh, musical business, uh, in promotion of the concerts and show um, production. So we do a lot of uh, musical recordings. We have studios and so on. Uh, then uh, I also work for uh, lots, uh, a lot for advertising. Uh, but most of all, for, for today, I'm uh, like musical promoter uh, and uh, some show and concert organizer. Fantastic. As you can see, everybody on this panel wears multiple hats <laughs> and brings lots of different projects and experience to the table. OK, um, let's get on to panelist number four by my maths. So we'll get Paul to quickly introduce himself. Hi there, I'm Paul McGiven. I, uh, I'm a booking agent at a company called Pitch and Smith. We represent about 50 artists for mainly mainland Europe and UK, but some for the whole world. And um, we work from 100 capacity shows up to five, 6,000 capacity. But alongside of that, um, I'm also the programmer on a concert series in Barcelona, which is traditionally 3,000 capacity a day. And we have artists, or we did have artists like Diana Ross and Cat Stevens through to younger developing artists like Woodkid playing. Fantastic. And finally, Rachel. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, yes, my name is Rachel Mingers. I oversee our custom music or our bespoke music offering at BMG. So that means I deal with uh, media writers as well as our um, commercial roster of artists. Um, so when anyone needs anything bespoke or custom, I'm, I oversee that project. Um, I, for the last 15 years or so, I've worked in music publishing with a real focus on sync um, and music licensing for TV and film. Um, the last five years, I've been a music supervisor where I've predominantly worked in the advertising space. So I license existing music as well as commission composers to work on adverts. So I've kind of, most of my focus has been in sync. Um, I'm now at BMG. Fantastic. Okay, so that's everybody introduced. So this session is all about making money out of your music making. And I suppose the reason why COVID is so relevant to that conversation is obviously COVID has had a big impact on the whole music industry in terms of you know generating income around music making. But I think what's what's also interesting is the impact has been very different depending on revenue stream. So certain revenue streams have been cut off completely. Certain revenue streams have taken a dip or they did take a dip early on in the COVID pandemic. And some revenue streams actually haven't been affected at all. So, so we'll, 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 as we talk to our different uh, panelists, we'll get their insights on within their part of the industry, what has the impact been? And of course, although it's a global pandemic, the actual impact has differed around the world, depending on what measures and restrictions have been required and instigated by local governments. So depending on the part of the industry you're in and where you are in the world, the exact impact will have been different. So I'm going to start off by finding out, although we are here to be positive and to look to the future, before we get into positive and looking to the future, let's just look back at the last 12 months and find out how COVID has impacted on, on each of our panellists in the countries where they're based and the businesses that we run. So let's let's begin with Marcel. Um, in terms of, of, of your business, you know, has COVID put everything on hold for the last, well, since last March? Or has it affected some parts of your business? You know, what has it been like in the country where you are based and with your part of the business? So basically, undeveloped countries in this uh, time of crisis has some kind of advantage because like, uh, less traveling for us means less um, chance to, to get virus inside of the country. So basically, we were playing like the uh, first six months of pandemic uh, before the diaspora was coming back to our country. So uh, basically, with our uh, background war experience in the 90s, we have this kind of mode when you just uh, engage it and you know that's like time of the crisis so, so so the luxury of other countries that they are having they have like transitions in like in 50 years or problems so, so basically we have this kind of just um feeling that we know how to cope with these kind of things because like it, it's just uh, like very fast switch from normal life to let's say secondary type of living so that's basically how uh, it's important how you react like in yourself you know like industry will always have problems so it doesn't matter what will gonna hit it but i think uh, that this kind of inner feeling for everybody is the most important thing no it, it has been really interesting seeing the impact of the virus and the, the, the necessary response around the world and i know a number of eastern european countries have managed to keep it under control much more than so say here in the uk and in fact i know some uk live music businesses who have been experimenting with shows in eastern european countries for things like you know testing doing tests at venues and and, and playing around with socially distant shows because it has been a lot easier to do that in some yeah, eastern yeah. European uh, less less system for some countries is a more a canvas for artists you know like so i think that's some kind of symbiotic uh, thing that can happen always. As it currently stands in, in early 2021, I mean, um, to, in terms of, say, live shows, I mean, are any live shows happening? I mean, here in the UK, we are pretty much now on full-on lockdown again. Nothing is happening. What, what is it like in, in your part of the world? Basically, um, we depend a lot of on the tourism. So we have, like, the, this kind of winter and summer season. So some things did happen, but it was like in the smaller scales, 200 or 300 people, and then less and less. And then now it's like on upper ski events in the mountain, it's like max 30 to 40 people. But somehow constantly something is happening. 
they are like uh, big folk clubs that are throwing parties and with police arriving like 500 people, like similar that you had like raves during the New Year's Eve. So depends on the culture and the background of the business. So some of the owners can pay uh, their fines so they don't uh, think about it and they just organize. Okay, so that there are things happening sometimes legitimately and sometimes less legitimately. Okay, let's ask a, a similar question of, of Olga next. I mean, in terms of um, both w where you are in the world, but also you know with the, the different projects that you have ongoing. You know, has has COVID caused things to stop, or has it been different? Depending, obviously, you talked about they have the education side as well. Has it been different for the different projects that you work on? Uh, yes, I'm living in Kharkiv. It's the second biggest city in Ukraine, uh, not the, the capital. Um, and uh, we have two main directions. This is a club and a school. And the um, club first, uh, of course, that was uh, like a big problem because uh, many gigs were declined. And uh, we have only two years uh, club uh, existing. And uh, that was the period when we first have such uh, a lot of uh, effort foreigners booked in this period of time. This was a historical maximum. And we like um, uh, lost a lot of money. And first, this was a stressful for, for sure. But of course, um, we have also a positive part of it. Because um, uh, when uh, at the, the summer starts, uh, we start to make day parties at the backyard of our club. And uh, this was uh, absolutely new format for us, because, uh, because before it, we only only use the uh, backyard for just like uh, um, hanging out and smoking and stuff. And the uh, people start to like daytime parties. And uh, this was pretty nice format, I think. Also, um, during uh, the pandemic, we have no ability to book any foreign artists. So we more focused on local ones. And um, uh, I think uh, a lot of guys who are living in Kharkiv uh, have never ever been uh, like uh, involved in this before, but that was a good chance for them to show up. And uh, for, for us, uh, like we just uh, stay uh, a, a bit uh, like uh, tight uh, comparatively to previous times, but we uh, keep on working somehow all the time. And also during the pandemic, we opened the second school um, in Kyiv because before it, we only have one in Kharkiv uh, because uh, that was for us the additional way of working to develop the school and um, at the first uh, period that was had a lot of success and uh, a lot of people come to us to like uh, study in our school in Kyiv so for school I think uh, it's even uh, was uh, some some good thing that happened uh, but now we have uh, another uh, wave of lockdown here in Ukraine uh, and uh, now we don't know what, what <laughs> what to what will be next for us and uh, for us this year was the crisis management and we don't look further than one month's uh, planning we only start uh, have really um, small parts of uh, like our plans now only like this i mean it's really interesting what you say about obviously there's there's various elements to it, isn't there? First of all, there is those countries where shows simply can't happen. Then there are those countries where we've had to work out what a socially distant show looks like. But I thought it was interesting you mentioning then the international travel element of it. Actually, in some of the countries where smaller shows have been possible, but international acts can't get to the country, weirdly, that's then an opportunity for, for, for local artists who wouldn't necessarily get those opportunities. Normally, people are eager for music. And, and maybe that's a way for those artists to get opportunities and play to an audience that in normal times, because they would be competing with international acts, they wouldn't get those opportunities. Yes, uh, for sure. And also, even uh, at the first part of lockdown, where uh, when uh, even uh, the trans uh, city uh, connection was not uh, uh, available, uh, we was uh, was super uh, focused on our local Kharkiv artists, even not uh, because uh, probably like the most part of our artists is from the capital from Kiev. And um, at the first part, we are making only online parties that was streams and uh, 
uh, we even made uh, some super long uh, online stream. It was 36 hours stream. And I think mostly like all of Kharkiv DJs were involved in it. Like uh, super, like even those who don't even, can even imagine that they were uh, playing at our club uh, were there. So for them, it was definitely the opportunity. Yeah, no, in, in, in a, a year where there was a lot of doom and gloom, it is it is good to look for some of the of the opportunities that appear. Um, I'm, I'm going to switch now to get a UK perspective. It's been interesting to hear what's been happening within Eastern Europe, but over here on the west end of the continent. Um, so I might start off with, with with Paul. What has it been like for, for you and your business? As soon as we started seeing lockdowns in March, we basically stopped. So um, I don't mean stopped work in terms of the income stream, just, just completely went. And we have tried to remain as positive as possible, um, but but also in terms of the timelines that we thought were going to be um, affecting the industry at first, which is radically wrong. So we had some some artists who were on tour in March and we thought, OK, well, well, we'll reschedule for April. And then, of course, how naive is that when you look, look back with hindsight? But I've done some tours when we've actually rescheduled from March to April, April to August, August to November. And now it's even into um well, then we moved into 2021, and then now we're even moving stuff into 2022. It's the the business model that we have is so heavily weighted on doing 100% capacity events that you, we've basically shifted everything to a period when we think is going to be safe. But then that period when we think is going to be safe keeps shifting. So that's when when you see all these tours moving around. Then what we've tried to do in the interim is is be positive and take advantage of. We just we don't just work in the UK. We work throughout the whole world. So we have had opportunities to put stuff together. We've been looking at socially distant shows. In fact, I had uh, four socially distanced tours going out in January, which overnight then you just press delete and then <laughs> then start again. But I think it's as long as you can stay in it, stay in it financially. I think we where you can just trying to be as positive with all of the different elements in the chain in the industry as well so it's not just us working with a promoter it's actually about the crew members within those teams and just trying to even though it might seem like a thankless task we've got to keep rescheduling we've got to keep trying to create something because all these people's livelihoods depend on it and prior to Christmas, we, we were joking with the now virtual office because we haven't actually seen each other for a long time. But um, I, I've rescheduled or cancelled over a thousand shows since the, since the start of this. So it's, it's essentially working three times as hard with no money coming in, but we feel it will come back and it's worth doing that. And just quickly on the other side of it, I as a buyer at a festival, we managed... Uh, in Spain, it's, it's a completely different situation to the UK. So what we did was we moved all international bands from 2020 to 2021 and rebooked within two weeks, I think, we rebooked an entirely domestic programme and managed to do a socially distanced version of the festival in the summer, which was one of the only events that happened in that window. Everything sold out, but we lost a crazy amount of money doing that. It's more about just trying to do something positive where you can. Yeah, I mean, that's been the interesting thing, hasn't it? Where you've seen socially distant shows in different countries is what for what artists in what venues does socially distant shows work, both creatively in terms of is it a, an exciting experience, but then commercially. I mean, it, it's actually for many artists, as you say, you're looking for as close to 100% capacity as possible. There is very little room in the system for be operating at, say, 40%, which is what a lot of people were proposing. Um, I'm going to come to Rachel next. I mean, we, we've talked quite a lot about the live side, and I think that's where the impact has been incredibly obvious. We know it because all the shows that we bought tickets for, all the festivals that were in our diaries for the summer, just all disappeared. So the impact on the live side has been catastrophic and really obvious. But it's not the only side of the music industry that has seen an impact. So maybe talk to us on the, the sync side and, and the publishing side. How has COVID impacted on, on your side of the business in a probably less obvious way? Sure. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, you know, I work across, as I said, kind of production music as well as commercial um, repertoire. 
Um, you know, we work across so many different verticals. We work, you know, mu we license music for ads, for TV programs, for online um, content, for films, for trailers. Um, so because of that, I think there's been varying um, effects on those different industries. I mean, definitely we've had we've seen um, a dip in in incoming uh, business from film companies because films aren't really being produced or, or they're being delayed or pushed back trailers as a result of those films not being released and, and advertising really um in march i was still at my previous firm where i was a music supervisor and i worked predominantly in advertising so we definitely felt a huge drop um people just weren't willing to sp invest in new content in new ads in new concepts so we found that actually a lot of the work we were doing is relicensing old tracks that had been used on previous campaigns. They weren't shooting new new footage. They were just using old ads, rehashing them and then kind of licensing them for um, maybe a shorter term because until we knew what, what the future was. Um, but then saying that on the flip side, we have, you know, BMG, for example, has really great relationships and partnerships with people like Netflix um, ITV, TikTok, and those t types of businesses have absolutely, although there's been a slight delay in Netflix's production um, slate, we're still working very, very regularly with those people. And we've seen a huge increase in those partnerships. Um, and and so, yes, I think I think the sync and production music industry as a whole is, is going to see a, a dip in revenue. Absolutely. Maybe we're envisaging 20, 25 percent. But but um, but, you know, because we diversify across so many different verticals and business types and territories as well, you know, we're at BMG as a very global company with a huge footprint. Um, so. So, yes, I think we're, you know, it's all balancing out. And so I think we're just really focusing on those areas that are seeing significant growth, like the TikToks and the Netflixes. Um, and, um, you know, I personally have never been busier, really. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Again, the the sort of the, the pros and the cons, because, yes, I mean, Hollywood shut down. So if, if you're synchronizing music into Hollywood movies, there are no Hollywood movies. The ad end agencies, as you say, put a lot of their campaigns on hold. But yes, but then obviously home entertainment has been booming. So so where you're working with home entertainment based services, while they may have some production issues because studios aren't, aren't, aren't open. Yeah. So there are there are opportunities over here to be capitalized on with the challenges over here. Those types of businesses, like you mentioned, like your um, online streaming services or these new, um, you know, Netflix and Amazons, they've they've learned a way of working that's a lot more agile and they can pivot very easily. So we've found that working with those types of businesses has been quite fruitful. Um, but yes, absolutely, as you said, the Hollywood, um, you know, if, if you're a, a, a composer that writes, you know, film scores only, then I think you'd, you'd really feel the impact here. and Or maybe you just have to pivot and move into slightly different areas. No, and I suppose, you know, obviously, that as well, our topic today is making money out of music. I mean, that is always a challenge, actually, in the music industry, but which has been escalated because of COVID, which is in the 2000s, when, when, when piracy was at a peak and streaming hadn't taken off, and there was a lot of narrative in the newspapers about how, how the music industry is in decline, the music industry is struggling, and it was always then, well, actually, the, the record industry is struggling because of piracy and streaming hasn't taken off yet. But the live industry is booming. Merchandise is in growth. Sync is, is really growing. So the industry at large always does fine. It's just that different revenue streams go up and down. And as an industry, we can deal with that. But obviously, as an individual musician or entrepreneur, that's a big challenge because often it's just unfortunate that you happen to be in the bit of the industry that suddenly is going down through no fault of your own. And it's like, well, it's, it's great that over here something's doing very well, but maybe as an artist or as an entrepreneur, you're not into that side of the business. And then it's sort of like, okay, how do I capitalize on that? How can I pivot over to that? And it's a huge challenge. We, sh we should acknowledge that. I'm going to come to Sergey next. I'm, uh, first, start off by asking the same question, the impact that COVID had on, on your projects, but also really interested to talk about a project you created in response to COVID and to find out a little bit more about how that came about and, and what that involved. Well, um, of course, when uh, it started last March, uh, we were, like everybody in our business, uh, sitting and uh, trying to understand what's going to happen next. And uh, as soon as we understood that nothing good will happen, we decided to change a profile of the concert. 
Well, if normally it's concert in its usual understanding, yes, it's, we have stage, we have audience, we have sound, and uh, that's it. Uh, if it's not possible, what to do? We have to keep um, uh, distance. And uh, we understood that hotel, which is empty at the moment, under restriction, under uh, all these pandemic issues, so they are empty and doing nothing and losing their money too. And that was, uh, uh, let's say, the motor of this idea. Uh, everything else was fast. So, as I said, we started to sit on us on March. And uh, on June, we already had first show in new format. For this, uh, we, we called it vertical concert or vertical show. And uh, it means that uh, we took a hotel, which is 10 uh, floors, and uh, uh, usually we have a restaurant in front of the hotel. The, uh, the restaurant may be uh, three floors high. Uh, it means the restaurant can be a stage. The roof of the restaurant can be a stage and situation is situated in front of the hotel. So hotel of 10th floor, so start, starting from 5th floor, it's possible already to have audience. Each room has a balcony. So uh, normal, uh, normal um, uh, size of room and balcony is, is, is it's okay for, uh, for people and VIP rooms for 8 people because they have 2 balconies. So we called to each other and said, look, uh, you can sit or we can take a small risk, not big risk, but small risk to do something because it's possible, you know, nobody will stop us because it's possible. People on balcony, uh, musicians on set, uh, we had uh, something 23, 25 meters of length from uh, balconies to the stage. Uh, so like that, uh, this we keep this distance which, which is possible. Balcony is separated from each other, so also possible. A uh, group of four people is 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 okay for um, uh, it's not restricted anymore. So uh, why not? We took this risk and uh, let's say we won. Of course, we we didn't earn a uh, lots of money. No, of course not, because we had no time, uh, not enough time to sell tickets uh, for good price and uh, to make this uh, fashionable, this event. But anyway, anyway, uh, we were lucky to, to have an uh, audience for each concert and we, we uh, every Saturday, it was maybe five concerts of uh, um, solo concert of uh, uh, big Ukrainian artists and then we took a risk to hold a festival there was not big money of course but anyway that was enough to cover the expenses of hotel of set of um, uh, uh, ticket office uh, so which uh, helps us to support our business our our guys everywhere, our technical workers, uh, ticket seller, everybody. So now we have, uh, uh, we plan for this year, we plan a tour uh, uh, on, here in Ukraine. We have nine uh, cities with wow. comfortable, with comfortable, as uh, I said, uh, location for this. Uh, welcome. Uh, let's say welcome. No, I mean it's a it's a really exciting project, and and I I mean I, I'm 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 not sure I've seen other projects quite as exciting as that one because I think that that that's that's so genius to to do and and to deliver. But I think it it is a sign that that within you know the music industry is a very creative industry. Of and course, thank you. Huge financial challenges. Um, and we have seen lots of artists and promoters and festivals and managers um, looking at, well, what can we do? And okay, 
it's it's really hard to make a huge amount of money out of any of these projects, but it, it but it, it keeps some people in employment. It allows some artists, well, first of all, to play because artists are eager to play, um, and also just the innovation. And you know, is is there anything we can learn from this that maybe we can take beyond COVID? And I, I'm going to quickly come back. I mean, I maybe ask Paul this question. Um, I mean, obviously, the other thing we've seen an awful lot of over the last few months, and and particularly here in the UK, but elsewhere as well, is people are playing around with the live concert streaming thing and i mean live concert streaming is not new i mean you've been able to live stream a concert for what 20 years now but we've seen a number of artists do this and a number of artists do it very well i mean what's your opinion on that do you think that was just a stopgap measure that we could bring in some income during covid or actually is there something that might last long term on the back of that is, is live concert streaming going to become a bigger part of the business even once covid is over i certainly think it's going to be around for for longer than just just these years it's it's a business model which we thought, like a lot of managers that we were in discussion with, that once you had the ability to to not be constrained by having a venue or a location, you, you could access the artist's entire audience globally. And what we've found over the last well, last six or seven months is they tend to be very focused on a hardcore amount of their own audience. And as much as we try and do and we develop partnerships with with festivals to present live streams, you're really playing to a hardcore of their fans. Um, so we kind of dropped the idea of trying to be like really expansive and bring in a new audience. But then we tried to, to work with artists to actually develop, well, what is this live experience you want to give to your, your audience? And there's various companies and platforms that, that do it very well. There's also new tech startups that haven't really thought through all of the different mechanisms and, and some of the legal stuff as well. Um, but um, we, we've we worked very closely with a number of a number of different platforms. One is a company called Side Door, who essentially use Zoom as the platform. So you can actually have a much more interactive experience. And the, the live show is then presented not only by the artist, but by a moderator as well, who can curate the questions can be talking to the audience throughout the performance. And then also just trying to bring in some of those, some of the lovely elements that an artist gets to see at, uh, at shows as well. So um, the moderator then curates the feed of the artist. So as they're playing, they get to see the live reaction. And we had one just before Christmas and it was, it was pretty emotional to see um, just people almost feel like they were in the room again. Um, I'm not saying this will ever uh, replace the experience of going to live shows. Um, it's something that I fell in love with many years ago and one of the reasons I got into the industry for this. Um, but I do think it allows an opportunity to have something which can then be factored into like a promo timeline that you can have a first performance of all the new songs from an album, perhaps, and then you're actually then bundling that in with pre-orders of an album and there's lots of creative ways of doing it i've also got another artist who who decided they didn't really want to go for the live live experience because they thought it was a a lesser version of what people would get na uh, normally in a, in a theater or a, a venue so he's he's decided to create something more similar to a documentary so he'll have uh he, He's very fortunate, has a very lovely house in the southwest of England in the countryside, so has a lot of space to play with. But um, he'll have the winter one with essentially welcoming people into the fireside with him and his band members. And it was pre-recorded at a time when that was allowed, that you could have the mixing of households. And then broadcast uh, in December, it felt very Christmassy. And we've already got the next one planned for spring, which is a very much an outdoor uh, style, style performance. But it it just allowed the audience to have a, a much uh, deeper understanding about where the artist is coming from. So if you're looking at streams not to bring in a new audience, but you're you're trying to provide something for your existing audience, doing something like that is great because they, they feel special and they feel included. And where you can then uh, add on merch that is either specific for that live stream or something which is you wouldn't be able to go on tour with. For, for example, this guy with the, the this doing the documentary thing, he's also a painter. So he allows then his audience to either, uh, we're working on some ideas at the moment about having very 
high quality prints or indeed original artwork then becomes a uh, a piece of merch because you can then you don't have to put it in the back of a van and tour around the world with it you then can can sell sell to that audience so there are lots of different positives i think it will be great to have use of this in the future in terms of the revenue stream to replace live concerts it's nowhere close so the ra- the kind of ratio that we work on is say an artist has 100,000 followers on social media and it's always debatable how engaged people are within those totals but if you could then convert 300 of those to buy a ticket to a performance you're doing quite well and um, if you then would extrapolate that model to the live platform that or that artist should be playing like 500 to a thousand capacity shows every night for 12 shows so it is a fraction of what the audience would be but as long as you understand it and you come up with something creative it can be a great way to connect with the audience no and i think for all journalists like myself we've talked a lot about the live streaming boom over the last eight months actually in some ways i think it's more of a director fan boom it, it is that thing of we've known for years now that you have this online fan base you can connect with them how you get those fans to spend money depends on who the fans are. But we've seen a lot of innovation in, in the COVID period of people saying, OK, who are our core fans? Who are those 300 fans? What will get them excited? How much money will they spend? And um, I'm aware we're kind of running out of time. And I just want to sort of finish off by, by getting a few of our panellists. Maybe if, 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 if we've got early career music makers tuning in, it's a really weird time to be an early career music maker, because usually I've done lots of events for British Council over the years where I have my set of advice of what you should be doing to build the fan base, to get the music streaming, to get people coming to your shows. But quite a lot of that advice is currently on hold while we wait for who knows, maybe another year, maybe more than another year for things to come back to normal. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with Marcel. I mean, what, what for, for young early, or not early career music makers tuning in, I mean, what tips or advice would you have for what they might be doing in the year ahead? to help grow the fan base and, and to make money out of their music as hopefully the COVID pandemic winds down, but is certainly going to be continue to have an impact for, for some time yet. So basically uh, the question is, do they want to go in the music industry if they are in the beginning? Um, because <laughs> now, now, now is the not a right moment to be just part of one industry. I think the new generation is aware of that, that they need to be uh, in the multiple worlds, you know, like to be uh, always uh, present in the digital uh, and the real one. I think that uh, stuff with the streaming is temporary solution. So people are afraid at homes, you know, like when they are watching that, they are afraid of that, that this is new normal, this is alternative for my club. So I don't want to experience that I don't want to pay that. I don't want to pay for this kind of bad nostalgic feeling of it. So I think that the, the, it needs to be, content needs to have the like, right direction for every young musician. I think it's important to find their un- unique uh, selling point. So uh, is your strategy regional, local? Uh, your podcast maybe uh, doesn't have, have like uh, impact in your country, but in a region could have. So, so I think just kind of positioning for young artists, I think is, is the biggest issue because maybe you, you are small in your country, but you'll be big in South Africa, you can reach there. So, so, so the, this kind of digital era allowing you to channel your content, your product, your whatever, to wherever your fan base is. So, so uh, from the A3 posters in 90s, uh, while doing promo, now you can target people that are 30 plus, loving the Amazon, Kindle, whatever, you know, like, and uh, listening to classic music. So I think we live in the age of targeting, but uh, we need first to think uh, what's our crowd and what we want to aim. So I, I think for the young artists, it's really mature thinking for young artists to expect from them, but it will save them a lot of time, you know, like um, killing their energy and productive time with like just trying uh, to imitate some kind of normal life. Yeah, so again, I guess, innovate, use those digital platforms to create not necessarily just the, the, the usual music content and then use that data and the analytics yeah, to work but, out uh, who are your audience and what gets them excited. 
they uh, they need to know themselves and what's their unique because a lot of creative artists now like our reaction to some scenes you know like uh, we had a lot of influence from uk germany and france and all our lives uh, musically in let's say electronic music we tried to imitate that so we didn't build our own identity with uh, uh, electronic music we were imitating those kind of scenes so maybe it will get us closer so so but for example something that happened with africa and, and lately and how they brand themselves and also like the eastern europe it's some kind of identity it's unique selling point and then you have content product whatever you want to sell it's relevant we all know we're running out of time but i just want to get both very quickly olga and rachel's input on that question in terms of what advice would you have for, for early career music makers to be using you know the, the next 12 months even though we're living in these strange times so maybe i'll start with with rachel just a very quick few words of advice and then we'll get we'll get olga to, to wrap things up sure um I suppose the question is, is, are you an artist or are you a composer? Are you, um, are you interested in getting involved in the music for media space? I think that's number one. And if so, there's so many different routes. Um, if you're an artist, there are really amazing sync companies out there who can represent your works um, and they just, they don't own it. They represent it for a set period of time. You're not, you know, give that a go. Um, if you're a composer, uh, do you want to write for score? You know, is that something that interests you? If so, there are so many um, music uh, agencies, production music companies out there who are doing a lot of work. You know, the composers I've spoken to this last year, sorry, 2020, have actually been the busiest they've ever been because this space is, as I'm uh, discussed, as we discussed earlier, is kind of there are certain areas that are really booming at the moment. Um, uh, or do you want to write, write production music? There's a huge opportunity there. There are production music companies who are working with composers to produce albums, which are then, you know, sent out to the world and then the sub-publisher network and, and pitched by extremely capable salespeople who then get your music used on TV, film, games and, and all of the above. So there's lots of opportunities. It just depends on if that's something that you're willing to explore as an artist or a composer. No, I suppose part of that is is being aware that that business to business side exists. And I mean, we all know about sync because every single music conference has a sync panel with four supervisors talking about how important sync is. But but sync isn't just synchronizing, you know, very famous tracks into movies. There were all those other elements of you could be composing music for whatever production music library or for a game or whatever. And you know, they're very competitive industries. There's lots of people trying to do it, but it is it's being aware there are lots of different ways you can be using your, your music making skills and creativity to generate income either instead of, you know, the other activity which you can't do anymore or ultimately as well of. And I suppose there is that trick, isn't it? The more different revenue streams you have, the more resistant you are, because who knows what the next big shock to the industry is going to be. Um, and, the, and the more revenues you have, the more shock resistant you are when the next big thing happens. We are almost out of time, but I just want to get Olga to come in likewise with some advice or some tips for the sort of early career music makers tuning in as, as to what do you think those people should be doing in the year ahead um, to, to grow their career, grow their audience and, and, and to make more money out of their music. Uh, first of all, I want to agree with Marcel uh, in the question that the live streams and some sort of uh, online stuff is only a temporary solution because in my specific area, we have some small underground club uh, with like 200 people capacity and um, uh, the online activities is more like in a nostalgic uh, way. It's not like growing a new community and Ukraine now is uh, in that situation when the music scene is only growing and we need to grow it more and we can maintain it with the online stuff. But for, uh, of course, people uh, should to stay online and stay tuned to not being uh, for, for, for forgotten. But uh, the main um, advice tip uh, that I can uh, give is just not to give up because we are now on the, um, like staying in front of uh, absolutely new era because um, 
Anyway, we are breaking the law somehow. We are making this kind of party a bit like uh, a more than allowed every time. And uh, we can see in Kiev this uh, big uh, uh, like gathering of people that go in against uh, the this uh, like scene. And um, this s- seems like for me as a new era of uh, underground uh, music uh, growing because uh, in like in Britain. In, in many countries, new music born with some uh, r- uh, resistance. And I think we are on the way, some new good stuff, and just don't give up, uh, keep on uh, uh, g- going deeper in uh, the thing you are doing, and uh, like uh, look what will happen, and don't uh, be uh, forgotten and sh- trying to be shown up from time to time. No, I think it's it's really important. I mean, obviously, we have to acknowledge how catastrophic it has been for the live industry and how many artists and people who work on that side of the business have really suffered over the last year. And and hopefully the industry and, and in, in some countries, governments have, have been able to help. But there, there is the upside. I remember in the midst of the 2000s, when the record industry was at its lowest ebb because streaming hadn't taken off yet and piracy was, was dominating. And I remember one of the biggest, most successful managers here in the UK who had been involved in the record industry since the 60s and the 70s he was sort of saying, whereas everyone else was doom and gloom, he was like, this is the most exciting time to be in the record industry because everything has broken. And now all the systems and the infrastructure that used to be fixed and and if you weren't willing to work that infrastructure or you couldn't work that infrastructure, you couldn't work with the industry. It's all gone. And and, okay, yes, it's risky and it's it's traumatic, but it's very exciting. And and I hope as the live industry comes back online later this year, um, all this innovation, these new styles of shows, all the stuff that's happening online, the director fan, the live streaming, there are some great opportunities there. Um, It is hard. And it's hard work, um, but I think innovation, collaboration, and all of that, as an artist, despite everything, I still stand by there has not been a more exciting time to be a music maker than in 2021. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but it is actually a really exciting time to be a, a talented songwriter, composer, producer, somebody making great music. Anyway, look at that. I've completely overrun on time. There was just so many interesting questions I wanted to cover. Um, so thanks so much to our panel, to Marcel, to Olga, to Sergey, to Paul, and to Rachel. Some fantastic insights and stories and advice from our panel there. Um, hey, there's lots more stuff coming up. So I'm just going to go back to my notes to check what I have to tell you. Oh, yes. Sally Ann Gross is coming up. This is a really interesting session. She's done a lot of fascinating work here in the UK on mental health in the music industry and on on what we can do to to protect the health and well-being of artists and musicians and people working in the industry as well. So uh, sometimes that work has asked the question, can music make you sick? And she is going to give all of the insights from her research in the next session in about 10 minutes time. So that's coming up. But in the meantime, thank you to my panel and thank you for tuning in. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.